Welcome back to Pager. We've got a really great episode in store for you today with a guest who I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. So Dr Fiona Godley is the current editor-in-chief of the British medical journal, the BMJ, and was really the perfect person to speak to continuing on our theme of evidence-based medicine that has been running through the podcast recently. Fiona joins us for a very far-reaching and pretty hard-hitting look at the current publishing and evidence generation frameworks in medicine. We talk quite a lot about conflicts, particularly financial, uh, the BMJ's own campaign for open data, and what this means, what it doesn't. We also dive into the future role of journals, and indeed the BMJ's own conflicts in wanting to raise the bar for research quality and transparency, but also not wanting to put off authors with too many hurdles to pass through. This leads us on to talking about collaboration between different journals and the best ways to encourage the sort of research that really benefits patients at the end of the day. Finally, we also delve into the interactions between medicine and climate change for the last few minutes. That's about all I need to say, really, so we hope you enjoy the episode. Fiona, welcome on the podcast. It's such a pleasure to have you with me today. So thanks for joining me. Great pleasure to be with you. Now, I'd like to start off because you've been editor-in-chief of the BMJ since 2005. So I'd just like to start off by asking, what is the BMJ's mission statement at its, at its core? The BMJ um, exists to help doctors make better decisions, to promote improvements in the quality and integrity of science and clinical practice, to uh, champion partnership with patients, and as an overall mission to help to create a healthier world. Those, that's quite a lot of stuff at once. Do these things ever conflict with each other in your world? Well, I think some people think we are um, for doctors um, and I can understand why that might be. And we we are, many of us are doctors and many of us uh, have a very positive attitude and view about medicine and doctoring. But our, our real um, mission is patients and the public. We act in the public interest. We aim for improved patient care. So it's a, it, it, sometimes those, those uh, do conflict. I mean, there are medics and there are researchers who don't act in the public's best interest or patients best interest they sometimes act in their own best interests or even unknowingly uh, do things that harm the public and patient interest by promoting treatments that don't work or by overstating research findings or by um, having other conflicting interests sometimes financial sometimes academic sometimes personal which uh, might make them tend towards not presenting things or acting in a way that is in the patient's or public's best interest. Mm, And certainly this is something I'd really like to get on to a bit later in the podcast. One thing I'd like to touch on first is that um, the BMJ is often described quite proudly as a campaigning journal, which I I think sort of fits in with what you were saying about it being there for patients and for the promotion of health. So what does this mean and what does it not mean? Well, the campaigning side of the BMJ has been there for a long time, that we, we take our permission, if you like, historically for campaigning from uh, one of the BMJ's great editors, Ernest Hart, who was um, a, a, an editor in the Victorian age, who uh, confronted with information about baby farming, which was a practice whereby people with illegitimate uh, children would farm them out to families um, and the families who were paid to take these illegitimate children would often either just let the child uh, die out in the cold or neglect them or generally mistreat them. And this was an issue that was taken up by medics, in doctors and other public health campaigners in the UK, uh, in England. And um, Ernest Hart uh, took it upon himself to put an advert in the papers pretending to be the father of an illegitimate child in order to identify uh, families and, and people who would come forward to take part in this corrupt practice. And, and that was written about in the BMJ. So we consider that to have been a sort of early example of a secret shopper or something like that. And um, that felt like permission really uh, from our predecessors to do this work. Um, and it's it's been something that my predecessor, Richard Smith, um, was was keen to do through editorials and through uh, other other approaches, meetings, roundtables. Uh, and what we did taking that forward was really to become much more journalistic about it and to actually uh, commission mm. from professional investigative journalists uh, such as uh, Brian Deere about the MMR vaccine fraud um, and from Deborah Cohen, who's been an investigations editor now working for Newsnight, 
and uh, from other investigative journalists actually to dig into issues. We've got Peter Doshi based in um, America. Uh, Rebecca Coombs now runs our investigations unit, uh, which was, is being externally funded. So we've got actually a much more professional approach to investigations. And the reason that works for us is because we have that now as a real tool in our a set of tools, which includes research, it includes uh, editorial academic commentary, it includes normal news items, uh, and it includes education articles. And we can sort of across the panoply of uncertainty and debate all the way through to certainty and guidance, mm. we can we can cover off a number of different things. So even, even um, we can then do campaigns based on research that we publish, we can do campaigns based on uh, guidelines that we help to put out there. Um, and many of our campaigns are very clinical uh, and some of them are much more related to public health and and it has been a, a, a real feature of the last 15 years of the journal to grow that side of what we do. How exactly do you pick which campaigns you end up taking up in the end because whilst healthcare is getting better and better there are still a number of areas in which probably wrap them off, off the top of your head could be improved in and you can't cover them all. No we absolutely can't cover them all I mean that it, 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 that is the thing that keeps us permanently engaged and fascinated and interested um, in uh, in what we do. And there's always something. I mean, the, we, we absolutely, and the BMJ's remit is incredibly broad because it does encompass um, specialist clinical medicine, generalist clinical medicine, all the way through, through community medicine, right into public health and into, um, uh, you know, human rights and, and social justice. So it, 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 we, we do consider that as our, as our, you know the spectrum of things that we cover and as i've said we in terms of what we the types of thing we publish it can be right from specialist research all the way through to um commentary and opinion uh, and education well so, so i mean the, the sorts of campaigns that we um have very much formalized and are long-standing and ongoing are about for example open access to clinical trial data that came out of the work we did on um on Tamiflu, Oseltamivir, which was the antiviral drug, which was touted and bought by many countries around the world at vast cost uh, back in the uh, bird flu pandemic in 2008-9, where we discovered that the evidence base for uh, the purchase of these drugs was extremely limited and and of very poor quality. And in collaboration with the Cochrane Collaboration, Tom Jefferson and colleagues, we uh, launched a campaign to try to get hold of the data for this, uh, this drug. And eventually after five years of campaigning, which took the took the um, w- w- which we did through uh, journalism, through investigations, through publishing all the correspondence online, through open letters to people like John Bell, who is the Regis Professor of Physics in Oxford, who's on the commercial board of Roche, which I still find extremely shocking. And Roche was the company that was refusing to allow these data to be um, to be um, made available. Eventually, Roche did make them available, and the Cochrane collaboration. Um, the Cochrane Collaboration did the analysis and found that the uh, drug was really not much use, despite billions of pounds and dollars being spent on it. And that led to a broader open data campaign, which has encompassed a request for the data on statins, which we still haven't, which still haven't been made available for independent scrutiny, especially on the harms of statins, um, and and open data generally, trying to look at what what does that mean, um, at what point should data from trials be made available and to whom and and in what way that protects patient confidentiality so there's lots of issues in there but Mm. the underlying um the underlying premise is that these data are 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 data that the public should have confidence that in at least independent scrutiny so not only scrutinized by by those who produce or, or or um run the trials and the companies that make the products and then leading on from that we we found ourselves you know increasingly we could fill the journal with stories about conflict of interest both in clinical practice and in research um, that led us to a campaign about uh, independence and the independence from financial conflict of interest in um, all aspects so um, education practice and research and we have a campaign running at the moment to try to find ways to increase the extent to which research for example is independently funded and uh, performed which is not the case for clinical trials largely at the moment and that um, education of doctors would be free of, of industry influence which again is not the case at the moment and that um, clinical practice would be free of the influence of doctors who are paid to um, by, by companies to um, promote and um, prescribe certain 
treatments. Uh, so it's a, it's a huge issue, and it, if you designed an issue with proper integrity mm. from scratch, you wouldn't have a, a system that was, was structured as it currently is. So that's about improving the evidence base and improving the way in which we implement that evidence base. Um, I mean, I, there, there are others, and you've asked me about how we decide on these things. Well, uh, I think, the one I would just yes. mention just briefly is patient partnership, which is a terrifically important campaign to actually put patients at the center of decision making and, and to have them in charge of, of their own care. Um, and as for how those decisions are made, I think you can sense that they kind of develop over time. Uh, the patient partnership one, uh, my colleague Tessa Richards is, a, is a, a GP and a physician, member of both colleges, and is also someone who's had a chronic illness and she's cared for uh, people with chronic illness. And she herself um, has been a terrific advocate for this. And so she's one of our editors. She's a long-standing colleague. She championed this. We took it on. So these things kind of come through the work we do. And we also get feedback from readers, you know, the ones that, that, that get picked up amongst readers um, are the ones we, we find we can pursue with more energy. You've covered so much there. Um, I'd like to kind of... <laughs> I mean, well, no, no, that's, there's more, there's that's, more. <laughs> that's, absolutely, that's absolutely fine. No, I'm, I'm thinking of a way to, um, to approach it. Well, let's go back, actually, if I may, just to just this uh, idea of open data, which I think is something that would shock quite a few people listening. And it certainly shocked me because... I think I'm right in saying when we're talking about open data, we're not talking about it's not that I can Google the data from Tamiflu and download it all and download um, all of it. It's a case of access for individuals who have a reasonable need to access it for um, the public good. But it just seems surprising that this system is not in has not been in place before. And we've had echoes of that when with the whole Surgisphere debacle in, in recent months. Why do you think that this this hasn't happened earlier? Well, I think I think you're right to be shocked, and and I, and I I feel slightly, you know, it, it, it's a failure, if you like, of all of us who've been working in this that that the system hasn't changed more quickly. Um, I think I think you know there are lots and of different factors. It's a complex. It's it, you know anything complex is much more difficult to resolve, and there are many people for whom the current system m makes sense, um, and they're not. It's not all bad. There are things in the current system that that are good, but. Um, I suppose it's grown up around the idea that researchers do research and they're the people who understand the data. Um, we've, they're the people who analyze the data. Their careers are associated with those data. They don't want to let other people, you know, they, 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 they need those data to build their research um, mm. portfolios. And the idea that they, the data actually belong, I'm talking about clinical trials here, but also observational studies, that the data belong to the patients, the public who actually contributed and been part of those studies. Um, is is a sort of dawning realization over the past 10, 15 years, maybe longer than that, but it, but it's it, it's been there for a while. Um, and why is it that we haven't therefore got a better system whereby people who sign up for trials say, "I'm doing this on the basis that my data will be made available to a broader group than simply the trialists who are going to analyze through the first mm. analysis." Um, that seems to be one one approach that we might try to take to get that instilled into those those um, consent forms um, and and then it would be the case that those data would be made anonymously available not necessarily to the public but potentially I would say but certainly to people who could be um, allowed to, 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 to independently scrutinize them and come up with their own answer to, to what they think that, that the studies show. I mean taking statins as an example with the statin trials which have led to uh, statins being the most widely prescribed type of drug in the world, in the in the mm. developed world, um, and to to also uh, new information over the last few years that seem to suggest that statins should be made of, prescribed to people at much lower risk of of heart disease, which would mean that pretty much everyone over the age of fifty would be on a statin. Um, and uh, those trials are, firstly, now quite old. Secondly, didn't include in them um, the, the necessary groups of people to make this wider uh, guideline. Um, and thirdly, have only been seen in terms of the detail of the data by the people who did the trials um, and a group of trialists who then write the systematic reviews, which then contribute to the editorial commentary that then contribute to the guidance. And then NICE comes down and other guidelines around the world about this wider, um, wider, uh, in, you know, prescription uh, potentially to people um, who are at lower risk. 
Uh, and and what's interesting about that is that the effectiveness data has been has been analysed, but the, the the harms data from those trials really hasn't been. So I mean, I only use that as one example, but a very egregious example of the current system, which, as you're saying, and I think, is deeply shocking. And and uh, I think it's a it's a failure that I have to also hold my hand up that we've allowed or failed, you know, to change the system, um, uh, even though we can see that it's just not 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 right. And I wonder whether this is slightly changed the the remit of uh, the BMJ and perhaps journals that are going to follow suit at some point because it's one thing actually having this open data and it's another thing doing something with it and analyzing it it's not it's not the case that you can look through and just eyeball it and say there's something wrong here in some cases no quite right and so I mean w- w- the, the whole movement towards open science is something that, that that we are very keen to champion but it's not as straightforward it's a very complicated thing and I um, it's complicated because there are financial financial reasons why uh, subscription based science journals have succeeded and you know publishers have, have benefited um, and with with going onto the onto the digital platforms uh, and open access to research which is what the BMJ has so that our study our research papers are published immediately online for everyone to see but then as you say there's the next piece which is the data behind those studies and traditionally journals have taken on trust the data they've they've all they've received is a written summary of the data uh we haven't traditionally gone back in and said can you send us the data uh we do that in cases where we suspect misconduct or fraud uh it can be very hard to get the data you need specialist skills to analyze it when it comes to things like the tamiflu and the statins campaigns uh, that has relied on people like tom jefferson peter doshi chris chris delmar people uh carl hennigan people uh, in um, positions where they have the skill sets and the sadly not enough resource, and that's another issue. But but they've they've done the extremely hard detailed work of analysing the data. Um, that's not something everyone could do, and and nor I mean a the struggle to get hold of it, b the skills and time to actually analyse it. So we have got a huge part of the future which involves uh databases where the data can be stored safely where access can be made available to appropriate people uh, and where there's enough resource and skill base for analysis Uh, and then how do you prioritize which of these should be you know which types of treatments do we most want to look at um i would Mm. argue we want most want to look at the ones that are widely prescribed um to, to to largely healthy people so this is public health interventions like like um those you know, antihypertensives, statins, those big cardiovascular drugs. We know uh, the work that Nassi has, uh, Hussein Nassi has been doing around cancer drugs, that the evidence base for those is often very poor. Uh, the regulators seem to be happy to approve drugs with very limited evidence. So that might be another area where we need to focus our attention. But it's a vast challenge. And mm. um, I don't want to underestimate the side of it that is beyond just getting access to the data there's another whole piece there about what what to do then yes i wonder uh, whether just a thought occurred to me now whether it would be a good idea just to mandate that if you're running a trial you need to pay for an independent analysis of the data because whilst it is resource intensive it's a drop in the ocean compared to running a large rct well interesting you should suggest that jama um, in america jama had a policy under its previous editor which was that for any randomized trial uh they had to provide um a, 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 an independent statistical analysis performed in an academic institution and kathy deangelis the editor felt that was necessary because she had been on a number of occasions found herself going to the company it was just a company-run trial um and asking for information and the company being unwilling to provide it so she felt that if one could have an academic based in an academic institution who had seen the data uh, that she would then have uh, you know able to go to that person's institutional boss and say your statistician has told us this we need you now to get them to give you know so she felt that would give her many more levers uh, the current editor, Hal Balkner, on, on, on arrival, a very good and excellent editor, but felt that this policy had, had been problematic for a number of reasons. I think not least because the number of trials submitted to JAMA had fallen as a result because that people weren't willing to go through that hoop. Yes. So, mm. um, you know, that shows you the, the, the sorts of de- how these decisions are being made. Um, I, th- I, think, I think absolutely part of the future would be resourcing the... the um, making the data ready 
in prospectively from the start instead of this huge job of, of, of retrospectively having to clean up data and make it available and put it on databases that we really need to have a system whereby as trials are done the data are made um, available uh, made it made um, appropriate so that they can be accessed in this way uh, by others beyond the trialists. Although perhaps knowledge that an independent statistical analysis is coming will lead to things being done slightly differently in in the first place. I wonder. Well, yes, I yeah, I think you could argue that, and um, I think that that may well be true. Um, but even so, if we could make the data, um, mm. oh, yeah, I, 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 you know, analyzable in a, in a straightforward in way, place. that in itself would be would be a, a great step forward. I think. And you touched upon a really interesting point, which I like to. Um, go into in a little bit more detail which is the idea that actually by setting the BMJ is a highly prestigious journal so is JAMA but they're not the only players in the field Um, they're not the only high impact factor journals so this worry that by setting certain standards high impact um, research will go somewhere else is that something you have um, you feel you have to balance well, I think sadly it is, and um, there's a group called the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, of which the BMJ is a member, as is New England Journal, JAMA, Lancet, Annals, the, the big general medical journals, um, and um, it, it's a sort of self-elect, self-elected group of editors who began um, looking at how to standardise things, really, so that it was easier for authors to move their papers between journals if they didn't get accepted in one move on to another so that was how it began and then it then it, it produces the, the guidance for authors um for submission to medical journals which many other journals subscribe to so it's, it, it has a good function and i'm pleased the bmj is a member of it uh, but at those discussions we find ourselves you know one journal will suggest a new policy uh, and the hope is that all the journals will will agree to adopt it as ICMJ policy, because if that happens, as happened with trial registration, where journals said they would no longer accept for peer review trials that hadn't been prospectively registered, that was in a very important that all journals in that high profile group agreed to that. Because if if if, if the New England Journal, for example, said, no, I'm not going to do that, um, then uh, then I think the other editors would have crumbled as well, because they would have, you know, that their, their journals would be damaged by putting a higher barrier to entry against people submitting to them um, so whenever one comes up with a policy um, ideally we would like all of those journals to adopt it where it doesn't happen um, then you then you make your own way and it can be problematic so I mean we at the BMJ came up with a policy which we wanted the others to adopt which they didn't adopt which was that we require authors of clinical trials to agree to make their data available on reasonable request and and that's something that we do at the bmj that the other journals have not adopted to the same extent so if that puts people off submitting their trials to the bmj um i would argue we don't want those trials but of course that that that's easy enough to say in in reality we'd love yeah. we'd love all those good clinical trials to come our way yeah to spin it in a, in a slightly more positive way you could say that the BMJ will gain a reputation for publishing because ultimately, I kind of I have this idea that these major journals they they almost act as uh, ver- verification systems isn't the right word just adding a tag onto something to say this has been properly vetted, and if you if the research in your journal gains all these tags saying the data is available um, the trial has been registered, um, suddenly readers can be much more trustworthy of what they read in your journal, even if another high profile journal is publishing um, a lot of other things that don't include those. Well, you're absolutely right. And I think that that's what we, we, we try to do. And, and, you know, all good journals will have policies that are, are, are directed at trying to raise the game, raise the, raise the level of, of how research is reported, how research is done. Um, and you know, another example is that we require authors to say how patients were involved in the research and, and, um, researchers at the beginning were saying well they weren't involved meaning they were involved as participants that's what they thought we meant no we mean were they involved in the design of the study were they involved in the the way in which it was reported were they told the results of the study participants and uh, a lot of researchers would have to say and we would publish that we published that alongside the study patients were not involved they have not been told the results ahead of this you know um Gradually, over the past mm. three or four years of this policy, we've seen an improvement, and we'd like to think that the journal has been part of that. So, going back to your to your point, yes, absolutely, we do think this is part of the brand. It's part of what it's part of our job, and and all the time there are ideas about how we could be part of 
pushing the systems forward and and that's why i think this grouping of the journals together is helpful because it's sort of friendly competition we say we're doing this why don't you do it too mm. and other journals come up with good ideas and we say great we'll do that too and the more that there's a kind of uh, a collective leadership in that way that the, the the quicker we can move the the barriers out of the way and and improve the overall quality of research um i think it's worth important to say journals have their own interests and and you know we have we're, we're business businesses we have to make money uh there's lots of um vested interest in being a, a a publisher of research that also you know um drives decisions and it would be wrong of me not to make that clear that, that we have to make a a profit through subscriptions through open access fees through advertising um, and a lot of that is driven by impact factor which is the thing that all journals desperately try to achieve a higher impact factor and there are ways of of doing that not only by publishing good research but by the way in which you structure your content so you know these are all things that are going on behind the scenes in which we 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 are i mean I, i'm happy to be open about and um that they, they do influence our decision making not about individual papers so much although that can be the case if, if reprint revenues are a really big part of your revenue streams for new england journal jamal Lancet, that's a big deal so individual papers will suddenly improve the re revenues of the journal um but in other ways that that whole sort of business side of journals inevitably does come into play and is there anything you would like to to change here because certainly impact factors have gained a lot of negative press as a way for quantifying the actual impact that a paper has and its translation in into practice yeah i mean the impact factor is is something that we have to work with at the moment um it, it's you know i i i um justify paying attention to the impact factor because it authors live you know still live and die by it and we want the bmj to be influential around the world and and the way one mm. way of doing that is is through usage of you know people who actually access what we publish but another is through the impact factor of the journal as a whole because that makes people think we're someone who should be listened to so um we have we do pay attention to impact factor but you're right it, it it's a flawed me metric in lots of ways and, and many people feel that it distorts uh what gets published uh, and i think that's true um there are certain types of studies and certain specialties which do much better on the impact factor cardiology for example as opposed to um psychiatry uh and also um types of studies um and, and what time of year they're published you know those sort of things all uh. make a difference which is rather weird um and there are other metrics which might be considered to be more useful as the h index there's i mean a, a huge list of different ways of assessing people's individual outputs as, as researchers um, the ORCID number that people have is a very helpful thing because it helps you track individual researchers. And I think the view is that um, things like the research um, excellence framework, the thing that judges whether institutions get the right get get funding for the next few years, um, the aim is that that should be based on an individual's um, performance rather than the company they keep within the journal that they published in. I mean, that, that's really what the impact factor shows you is is who else published in that journal alongside you if you see what i mean so um i think this is a, a piece of work we we at the bmj are involved in discussions and and campaigns to try to move things away from the overwhelming focus on impact factor uh, there's a there's a, a movement called dora based in mm. the west coast of america i'm sure you're aware which is looking at different measures and uh, trying to get journals to sign up to promote those other measures instead so uh, I, I think it's it is a it is a really um, topical and important thing to keep and keep working on. I think at at the core of this has been this growing realization and worry that actually lots of research being done around the world seems to be mainly designed to profit industry rather than actually benefit patients. So within this, we've talked a bit about almost how you how you deal with papers that come across your desk. But the other question here is how can you influence the papers that um, people send in in the first place? What, what's the BMJ doing to kind of incentivize actually the sort of research that the, the world really benefits from? That's a very good question. I mean, journals can only publish what they get sent. Um, and so influencing the research agenda and promoting, if you like, or, or making clear calls out for 
types of research that um, you know might as you say be looking at issues that are otherwise being neglected I think that's the sort of behind your question is you know there's a lot of trials that are me too trials funded by industry that actually won't make a big difference to clinical care and um, or patient outcomes and how do we attract or encourage research that is more useful and, and looking at global burdens of disease around the world. I mean, I think the Lancet's done a really excellent job of focusing on global health, you mm. know, where, where are the real needs globally? Um, and the BMJ, we, we want to do that too through advocacy, through um, editorials, through uh, opinion, um, through the investigations we're doing, you know, to try to highlight how the research agenda is distorted and, and how it needs to be um, re- uh, calibrated, if you like, so that so that we do actually address the the, the key issues. I mean, the whole COVID uh, ep- this this pandemic has been mm-hmm. fascinating in that respect because suddenly, overnight, every pretty much everyone is suddenly focused on this single disease, and um, all the journals, all the general medical journals, have found themselves completely dominated. Rightly so, you could argue. I mean, it's been a completely unprecedented in modern times event. Uh, but the sheer numbers and volume and proportion of research that suddenly sent our way is about COVID. Um, mm. Initially, case reports, then observational studies, then uh, and then the, the trials are coming through, um, then the vaccine trials, flawed as they are. Uh, uh, the BMJ has published quite a lot on, on this. Um, you know, th- this is exactly uh, a, a sort of in, 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 in a macro, macro way what goes on in other ways. Uh, we find ourselves before COVID suddenly a, a little slew of research papers on some issue, some condition. Um, and then if you had your eye on the ball, you'd spot advertising campaigns for a new drug in that condition. And so you can actually track the publishing strategy of industry uh, to plant the, the 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 problem, you know, restless legs, let's say, which I'm not going to pretend isn't an issue. I've suffered it myself during pregnancy at one point, very horrible. But it is a, an issue that suddenly becomes big. Suddenly then you get talk about, um, uh, you know, ways of treating it and then, then the trials come through. And so you can actually understand how we're being manipulated as, as an output for science. To be slightly cynical when you see um, kind of key opinion leaders employed by industry to ramp up excitement around something as these trials come along, I can see how that could form form a part of it. No, I was yes, I was laughing earlier because um I thought this is going to be one of the longest conversations I've had in the last several months. Um before then where we didn't talk about covid, we hadn't mentioned it once. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I know. Uh the other thing I'd love to talk about George is climate change, but um so we could perhaps talk about both those things together. Oh yeah, that would be that would be fantastic. What actually one question I had one question I had just there was we've got I think two parts here. We've got the the um actually where the research agenda is. Um, whether it's focusing on the actual major problems in our community and the research questions there. And then we have answering the right questions, but in the wrong way. And I imagine that BMJ is put in a difficult position um, because on one hand, you want to scrutinise and uphold a high standard of research. But on the other hand, there might be research that doesn't quite get up as um, to as high a level as it perhaps should. If you take, say, Pfizer's vaccine um, trial, when the paper for that inevitably comes out, I don't see how any journal is going to turn it down, but it could have significant flaws within it. How can you yeah. almost change what what research is done for a particular um, a particular question here? Well, changing changing what research is done, I think is is, is you know we 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 do that through trying to um, influence funders and ethics committees to make sure that they. Um, that they put in right the checks and balances from the outset. Um, in terms of in terms of the reporting of a study that's already been done, you can do quite a lot, and we work very hard to make sure, and I think other good journals will too, to make sure that um, the authors aren't overstating their uh, results, that the results properly um, contribute to the conclusions, uh, that the methods are properly reported. Uh, we try to make clear that the interventions are well described, so people could repeat the studies. Um, and also that um, the limitations are very clearly stated. So we have a section on limitations of the study. Uh, in relation to the vaccine trials, we, we, if we were to publish the Pfizer study, uh, we've already published, Peter Doshi's written two good pieces about the problems of the vaccine trials as a whole. 
one of which is that certainly it's not clear from the press release that is the only announcement we've so far seen about the Pfizer study. Um, but by the time people listen to this, other things will no doubt have come out. But um, that, that it's not clear whether they're saying that the vaccine um, prevents what, what, what level of severity of disease the vaccine is mm. apparently presenting, preventing. So is it a mild illness? Is it a serious illness and death? Um, does it reduce um, infectivity? And in whom is it is it safe to use? Who who has been included in these studies? I mean, the people, the groups, the most vulnerable groups will be elderly, frail people with other conditions, and people from the Indeed. PAME, the main community. So you know, the, I don't know how many of those groups of people were represented in the trials. Uh, as I understand it, it would need to have huge numbers in any trial to really show uh, properly whether the the, the 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 vaccine was effective against more rare outcomes such as serious disease and, and death um yes so those are issues which we would want to make clear in any reporting of this study that it had its limitations those limitations may be completely understandable given the current urgency of the pandemic but we would need to have that up front so that people would know what would they, what what this could could and couldn't say about the vaccine although unfortunately at times we do see limitations which are not understandable given the resources that the organisations studying a particular intervention have at their disposal. We've had uh, um, Vinay Prasad on, who's spoken on a podcast about actually the need to shift analysis of drugs and um, medical devices, for example, uh, out of the conflicted bodies which profit from um, the positive results. Would you go as far as saying that this is necessary? I would absolutely, and that's that's at the, at the heart of part of the campaign around independence. That you know, um, it, 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 it you wouldn't design a system where the manufacturers of a, of a product were um, responsible for evaluation and, and reporting of those evaluations and, and held on to the data. That just isn't something that would, you know, we, car manufacturers can't do that. I think even though Volkswagen did its best at one point to to, <laughs> yes. to distort the findings, the outputs, but um, but so I absolutely agree that that we should have independent research to evaluate drugs and, and the drug companies should not be doing this. Uh, the question is, should journals stop publishing uh, studies that are funded by, uh, we don't publish tobacco industry research, uh, should we stop publishing industry uh, research funded by the food industry, the alcohol industry, um, and indeed the pharmaceutical industry, should, should those um, be considered to be too conflicted? And uh, at the moment, the way we manage that is by having checks and balances, policies in place, commitments from the authors that they're allowed to publish, that they're free to to conclude what they what they find. Um, and uh, is that enough? That's the question. Um, I would mm. like to see in the long run research not published in journals, but published on databases and journals to be the people who help to interpret and, and set in context that research for different groups. Uh, I think that will be the right direction of travel um, and it, it comes back to that point earlier on in the conversation about databases for actual results of research uh, rather than these rather limited and potentially um, misleading just text-based reports that currently currently appear in journals. Mm. And certainly it seems that uh, the publishing of uh, papers more and more on preprint servers is a step in, in this direction. Yes, mm. absolutely. And I, yes. I wonder, I wonder, going back to one of your points before, that actually the overwhelming evidence does suggest that even, even if you can introduce some checks and balances, simply having a financial conflict of interest for a researcher has a significant um, effect on them and is more likely to bias um, them towards a positive finding in, um, in the case of trialling trialing something. So whether actually mm, this is a stepping stone to something more. You mean the preprint servers, or? Oh, um, sorry, I meant um, uh, declare well, declaring interests and declaring editorial freedom seems to be only a stepping stone um, towards our uh, what should be our actual long term goal in this scenario. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. So the w people tend to think that declaring conflict of interest is is the uh, is the end. Uh, I think it's should be clear certainly i think it's clear that, that that's just the means to the end we need to have the declarations they're not complete at the moment people don't always declare everything they should we we're, we're one of our 
campaigns at the BMJ is for a um, a database of conflicts of interest that so people could just kind of enter their conflicts once in one place and keep those up to date. Um, as a senior in America like, with the Sunshine Act. The Sunshine Act, Act exactly. So we, we were looking for hopefully a UK Sunshine Act of some sort and a database that might be held by the regulator, the medical regulator or um, academic institutions. Um, so that's to get the declaration uh, sorted. And, and then, you know, uh, but that's a means to an end. And the end itself is to manage and and limit or preferably remove as many of those financial conflicts of interest as we possibly can from research education and practice mm. and fundamentally it seems that this requires a shift in resources from uh, industry to independent analysis to reanalysis of data um, or to verification of of trials with with further trials which seem to be lacking in our current funding structure despite good efforts from government organizations and charities yeah i think that's absolutely right so so um y- you'll know about these things but there are there are various models which is and we're trying to highlight those in the work that we're doing on this independence campaign um the one that gets quoted a lot is is in italy where um the manufacturers are asked to put a proportion of their marketing budget into independent um studies head-to-head comparisons and, and studies of orphan drugs um, and and that's a model that means what you're doing is effectively if you want to license your drug in Italy you have to put this money into this other pot uh, it's not perfect but it's a it's a it gives an idea of how um, one might structure a system where money gets put into a central pot and allocated to to to, to well-designed independent trials and it's not <laughs> when, when I actually think about it it's not an unfair thing to to ask if uh, surely getting effective evidence for an intervention is part and parcel of the costs of of doing business really absolutely i mean i i agree with you entirely and i i think i think the more people we can I, some people just you say this too and they just say it's naive why is it needed you know things work perfectly fine now i think they're not working fine now um, it is needed and and i think naivety in this context is a good thing we say this is what should happen now let's try to make it happen uh, and and so this this work we're doing o- o- on this campaign is really trying to highlight examples of good practice and and map pathways to um, to to this greater independence for for research. Now I think we're we're slightly running out of time, but you mentioned earlier climate change, and I think to I think to set the scene to set the scene from that we've had um, growing interest from major journals on the impact of climate change on health and the rec- recognition that it really is a it's a global problem and it's a health problem for for various reasons and it requires enormous efforts by government and indeed the healthcare se- sector to do what it can. I'm not really sure what my question um, question here is, but what are you excited about um, or perhaps worried about in this area? Well, I think the, the, the good news is that, yes, we're getting um, much more uh, traction. This is mainstream, that it is a health issue, that health professionals have a, a legitimate and important voice and are beginning, you know, in quite big numbers to step into that role of, of, of advocating for action against climate change and, and seeing it as part of their job to do that. And that, that's been a shift over the past 10, 15 years. When, when journals like the BMJ started writing about this, we were told that this wasn't our job and that it wasn't up to doctors to get involved and what on earth were we thinking. So this is, that is good news. And it's been a, you could argue, rather slow, but, but it, has, it is happening. Uh, we've got um, initiatives like the zero zero um, uh, carbon health systems, the NHS wanting to become the first carbon neutral health system in the world and real commitment at a senior level um, for that and funding um, to, to, to work towards that. And that's with, with the Sustainable Development Unit helping to map the, da- map the data on where the big carbon footprints are and, and what can be done uh, to remove those and gradually reduce those. That That is, is really great progress. And I think the other positive thing is that um, the pandemic, which in its own way could be considered to be very much a product of globalization and um, the damage to the environment that has forced Chinese uh, people into the wet markets because they've been sort of pushed off their land and they're running out of, you know, the sort of economic crisis that's led people to behaviors mm. that are incredibly risky and have led, led eventually to the whole world being shut down. The shutdown itself has led us to think, well, actually, we can stop the world if needed. We can stop the world. And we all remember the bird song and the quiet and the 
lack of traffic and the and the blue skies that followed uh, with lockdown um and that that seems to be something that we can hang on to and say in 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 rebuilding our economies uh, after covid um we must 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 have within those rebuildings climate change and, and the tackling of climate change at our uh, at the forefront of our minds so mm. i mean i am hopeful but it, but it, it, we've got a huge challenge ahead and i think health healthcare presents a particular conundrum here in that it's it's one thing um trying to reduce uh, the number of non-recyclable things i i use on a day-to-day basis for in the kitchen for example or and it's another thing to say actually this drug has too high a carbon footprint when the compromises i think some people can see the compromises in hospitals and in the healthcare sector to be to the detriment of of patients yeah um, well, how do we that, approach this yeah absolutely right and i mean you raise a really important point about the uh, conflict potentially between lowering carbon and um decisions about individual patient care i think a big hope sits in redesigning care so that it's more um, efficient effective and patient-centered in ways that would reduce people's need to travel to and from hospitals uh, to reduce their time in hospitals so there's lots of issues that we can pursue in that way the way that Mm. hospitals and general practices themselves can become more more um more carbon neutral and also you know electric ambulances all those things we can slowly kind of chip away at and hopefully quickly chip away at and then there's the stuff about actual clinical choices so types of gases that anesthetists use that that um you know yes, with no change with no change in the clinical benefit I, i'm told uh, the gas the inhalers substances in inhalers that can be equally as good but with a, with a more climate friendly um product uh, and then, yes, I think rightly so, we should start looking at the carbon footprint of individual treatments, because very often, just as we have branded versus generic, there will be uh, drugs that have a very high carbon footprint. We don't know about that. And I think you could say, begin to say to the patient, you know, there are these two drugs, they seem to be equivalent. One has, you know, 10 times the carbon footprint of the other, which would you like? And I guess most patients would say, well, I'll go for the low carbon footprint one, unless you can give me real clear evidence that it's actually going to be less good so i think Mm. those are exactly the conversations we need to have we need to have the data we need drug companies to be open and on board about this which i mean i think many of them are uh we need to look at packaging we need to look at um you know renal dialysis there's all sorts of ways in which that can the, 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 the renal dialysis community has done quite a lot uh through the um sustainable healthcare organization that rachel stancliffe and others work in to look at things like that and reduce the um climate imprint of of individual interventions like dialysis so and then there's the whole mental health um i don't know I mean, we could go on there's you know psychiatrists have also been the of Royal psychiatry has been incredibly active uh, looking at not only the health benefits of of um active travel and being outside and all of those things the concern that air pollution damages mental health um, there's evidence that it increases depression and anxiety and then um, what psychiatrists can do in terms of their own personal impact as professionals on climate um, mm. pressures. And I think I think one way to link all this together is that certainly there are costs to to climate change and countries are moving towards putting a price on carbon and I think if we can put a price on carbon then surely that can be factored into um, the decision making um, in a much more, I think, standardised way than it otherwise would be at a um, almost at the top of the pyramid at, at the level of Nice, for example. Yes, I would like to see that certainly at Nice and and bodies like that. And there's also the other, you know, making the making the uh, manufacturer pay the cost of things like environmental pollution. There's quite a lot of uh, runoff from uh, pharmaceutical production that actually goes into the water and the sea. And the- that I think brings up the point that I that i tried to make earlier that um, if you change the incentive structures around these things it's not just a case of charging people more or or, um, making people reveal data actually it can change the decisions that lead up to that and if suddenly it's a you take a financial hit for having a manufacturing process that produces a lot of carbon then the incentives are there to change it i think that's right and that um, i i mean that that's where my optimism lies is that there are levers we can bring to bear and if um, doctors can be part of the voice that goes to politicians to say have courage here uh, and 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 you know really crit- critical where they fail to act um, to, to set up those kind of incentives 
uh, I think I think we do have a really important voice and we need to use it. I think I'd like to end on, we've talked a lot about, well, certainly grappling with the problems of, of the future. Um, and I'd like to look back slightly um, for uh, what will be the last couple of minutes and just to ask you, um, in 15 years at the BMJ, what are you most proud of? Well, um, I think I'd like to first of all say the team. We have a fantastic team and, and that's been, I, I inherited a good team and I think only, uh, you know, it has only improved and built and the, the, the expertise and the commitment and the integrity and the, um, the, the pleasure of working with really bright, good, strong, brave people has been a, a, a huge um, pleasure for me and I really am very proud of that. Um, I'm very proud of our champion of open access research. Uh, we've done that mm. from the outset. I think that's been been an important part of who we are, uh, and the campaigns um, have I think characterised the past fifteen years, growing as they have done, and now with the launch of our investigation investigative journalism unit, which is a sort of uh, where where that expertise will now be housed. Um, that is is something I'm I'm very proud of. Um, I think that. Um, the community of people who contribute to the BMJ. We have a very uh, um, great uh, body of people now writing for our opinion section, which has grown up in the last three or four years. And we are a journal that relies on the people who contribute to it, to it uh, as, as all journals do. But we have, a, I think, a, a really pretty unique set of um, fantastic international allies friends advisors contributors uh, and that wider community which has built and built over the past i would say you know longer than the 15 years i've been in charge but over uh, it, there's a there's a real feeling of that group of people mm. um dispersed geographically but but very bound in with the mission of the journal to improve research and healthcare and to, to act in the public interest mm. and i think that's one reason why the bmj is so well regarded and indeed well read amongst so many groups of people um, around the world. In fact, we've, we've we've interviewed, I think, some of your writers on on occasions, and hopefully, we'll interview um, some more in the future. Um, so, I think that'll be a good note to to end on for today. So, Fiona, it's been so kind of you to um, chat with me this Friday, and all I'd like to say really is thank you at this stage, and um, good luck with all the uh, work that you're doing because I'm sure you're incredibly busy. Thank you very much, George. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And if anyone wants to email me after hearing this, fgodley at bmj.com. Thanks for listening to the Pager Podcast. If you've enjoyed it, do leave us a review, share it with a friend, and come back to listen to our other episodes. As ever, we'd love to hear what you think. You can reach us at Pager Podcast on Instagram and Twitter, or email us at pagerpodcast at gmail.com. Bye for now.